the lineup for you on this Friday edition of the Now. One state now considering a cigarette tax of over $4. But do these taxes actually work? We break down the numbers. And when you get your hair cut, there are usually different prices for men and women. Well, now one salon is trying to eliminate the disparity with a new pricing system. And most of the country will change their clocks this weekend. But it brings up the debate, should people still be switching? Ahead, one man's mission to make a permanent change. Thank you, Chris. I'm Amanda Starantino. We are following developments today as Indiana confirms its first case of coronavirus. State and county health leaders are emphasizing the risk to the general public is minimal. But Governor Eric Holcomb did declare a public health emergency as a way to get federal funds on the way. Right now, we know the infected patient is male and lives in Marion County. He came to Community North Hospital last night after calling ahead, which led hospital staff properly prepared to contain the risk. That man recently traveled to Boston, where it's believed he made contact with people with the virus. Deeper details on this case ahead on the news at 6. And the coronavirus is nothing new to a team of researchers at Butler University. They've been studying it for several years now, hoping to learn more about various strains and how it replicates. The researchers say their goal is to provide information to those who create drugs, so they have the info they need to create a treatment. We never expected that we'd see this research coincide with a, a current coronavirus outbreak. Uh, this isn't a new idea that coronavirus has caused these emerging outbreaks. This is the third emerging outbreak in the last 20 years caused by a coronavirus, the first two being SARS and MERS. They hope to wrap their research up and publish their findings in the next three to six months. And comparisons between the flu and the coronavirus have come up. Working for URTV6 reached out to local doctors for perspective. They say right now the risk for the flu is much higher than the coronavirus, but they have similar symptoms. Both can lead to respiratory problems and fever, but the flu tends to cause more body aches than the coronavirus, and you'll see symptoms quicker after being exposed to it. Dr. Cole Beeler with IU Health says one big difference is the unknown factor with the coronavirus. Until we have more information on the virus, it's gonna be scary. Uh, I think it's definitely something that we need to keep our eye on and definitely something that we take and build up policies on to make sure that we're not missing anything. Uh, but certainly influenza is a known beast. Uh, we see it every single year. Um, and since we see it every year, we're a little bit more comfortable with it. And people probably have gotten the flu and they know that they can survive the flu. A large study in China found that about 80% of confirmed cases of coronavirus had fairly mild symptoms. Like the flu, the most at risk are the very young, older people, and those with respiratory problems. Kevin, a gray day outside here today. Every day is gray for me. At least for my yeah, hair, hair yeah. color. All right. It'll be a brighter weekend. How about that? And you see off to the west some breaks in the cloud cover. I'll show you the dividing line where we go from cloudy to sunshine here in a second. Temperatures going up over the weekend after a cold start tomorrow morning. Got to work that in there. 35, our temperature now. That wind is still making it feel colder. There's the cloud cover. But as you get western portions of the state starting to thin out, and then you see the rather sharp clearing line here west of the Wabash, sunshine over in Illinois, departing clouds slowly pushing to the east. Uh, from the Hoosier State. Temperature 34 in Peru, 38 in Bedford. Temperatures will change slowly, but once the sky clears, that will give temperatures a chance to drop off a little more steeply. By 11 o'clock tonight, we're at 29. It won't be as windy at that hour. Once the sun sets, that'll help calm the wind, and you see the trend here right on down to where we'll wake up tomorrow morning with winds 5 to 10 miles per hour, and we'll wake up to these cold temperatures. There's a lot more fear and anxiety surrounding coronavirus than, let's say, the flu, which is still statistically more dangerous. But part of the reason is some of the top performing articles online that's related to the disease feature debunked claims or sensational headlines, according to Newswhip. Google searches have increased eight times. What's unique about coronavirus, it has virtually all the characteristics of high perceived risk, high concern and high worry. Vincent Cavello studies the science behind people's response to crisis issues. He says coronavirus arguably has the perfect storm of psychological fear factors. There are 20 that people use to gauge how concerned they are about a threat. Coronavirus has 17, including things like effects on the future or vulnerable populations. But the most important factor, Cavello says, is trust. When we don't trust those managing or sharing information, we become a lot more concerned. When I say higher, I'm talking about exponential now, not just simply sort of uh, 
a little bit higher. We're talking about sometimes as much as a thousand fold higher, simply because I don't trust the source of information or I don't trust those that are managing the situation. The consequences of this level of concern is fear, which can produce stress, outrage, and even denial. Cavello says one way to decrease your concern is stick to the most credible virus sources once a day. Groups like the CDC, World Health Organization, and state health departments. But by the way, coronavirus appears to be creating the most concern only second to nuclear power disasters, which had the full 20 characteristics. One of the important missing fear factors with coronavirus is children, because it's not impacting them as much. Checking the news feed, renewed concerns about the flu. The CDC is saying 136 kids have died as a result of getting the illness. That's already way more than we saw during the last flu season. Unemployment is at a 50-year low. The 3.5% unemployment rate was released today, and it was measured back in mid-February. The numbers are from before the worldwide coronavirus outbreak, though. And one of the famous enormous stone heads on Easter Island in the Pacific Ocean has been destroyed. Investigators say a vehicle's brakes failed before it crashed into the monument. All right, back to our lineup. There are constant pleas to get schools more money. And there's an important opportunity coming up to increase funding. The new approach to get classrooms and families to participate. Get rallies delivered. Three coronavirus headlines topping this news feed. Coronavirus has hit the country where the Pope lives. A patient at a clinic in the Vatican City tested positive. Tinder is using pop-up alerts to remind users to stay healthy. So Tinder is that popular cell phone dating app. While on-screen tips remind users not to touch their faces and to use hand sanitizer. Costco's business is booming and experts say it's in thanks in part to concerns about the virus. Costco's growth increased in the latest quarter. Experts do say Costco's business though was looking up even before coronavirus emerged. Classroom size and funding is something of concern at many schools that are across the country. And now more students are getting brought into the discussion and specifically about an upcoming opportunity to improve funding. So everything in schools from Title I to after school programs, to lunch programs, to school technology, things that you know affect the students on a daily basis are, can be affected by census funding that comes from a census count. The Census Bureau statistics in school programs help teachers incorporate age-appropriate census data and lessons into their curriculum. It launched this week and students may even come home with letters today reminding parents about the upcoming 2020 census count. Everyone will start getting postcards in the mail about the census next week. But children under five were among the most undercounted population during the last census. You know, if you have a kid in kindergarten right now and they don't get counted, they're going to be in high school in 10 years. So that is 10 years of like being on the bus and school supplies and other things that they will not possibly get funding for. Census funding also supports programs like nutrition assistance, foster care, the children's health insurance program, and housing assistance. There are all sorts of answers about how children in any living situation should be counted on the census website. Well, ahead in our lineup, one state is looking at making its cigarette tax over $4. But just how effective are these taxes? We're digging into that issue ahead. Shop and save today at Ashley Home Store. One state is thinking of hiking cigarette taxes to one of the highest in the country. The push follows what several other states have already done. Supporters say the higher taxes encourage people to quit smoking or just not start at all. Maya Rodriguez is asking if data shows that really works. Smoking has been a lifelong habit for Pete Quinto. Since I was 21, I'm 53. He lives in New Jersey, a state where the tax on cigarettes is just under $3 a pack. But it could be higher. I know New York is pretty high, $15 a pack. And New Jersey may soon be joining them. The governor is proposing a state cigarette tax of $4.35 a pack, placing it with New York and Connecticut as one of the highest cigarette taxes in the nation. The very highest? Washington, D.C. at $4.50 a pack. 
But those taxes vary wildly across the country. The lowest, a mere 17 cents in Missouri. Others include 30 cents in Virginia, 84 cents in Colorado, and $1.33 in Florida. Raising taxes is the quickest way to reduce tobacco use, particularly among young people in the poor on whom the tobacco industry preys. Matthew Myers heads up the campaign for tobacco-free kids. He says there is a direct link between higher cigarette taxes and lower smoking rates. The advantage of tobacco taxes is they reduce tobacco use more effectively, more efficiently, and more predictably than any other single tactic while also raising revenue for government. But critics have pointed out that lower income smokers get hit the hardest by taxes like these. And a Surgeon General report earlier this year found that they have the least access to programs to help them quit. Still, at least one academic study shows the connection between higher taxes and lower smoking rates. It looked at the price of cigarettes and their sales from 1970 to 2017. The findings? The higher the cigarette price, the fewer packs sold. In an ideal world, we would be down to zero, but we're a long way from there. <coughs> Back in New Jersey, Pete Quinto says if the tax goes up as much as proposed, he might finally quit. Unless, yeah, most definitely. I'm not paying all that money. In Cumberland County, New Jersey, I'm Maya Rodriguez reporting. Maya, thank you. We'll turn into the news feed. Facebook is suing companies that register website addresses that Facebook says are meant to trick you. Okay, so Facebook wants to stop companies from registering addresses like Instagram businesses, businesshelp.com or facebooklogin.com. Now, the sites aren't affiliated with Facebook or even with Instagram. Well, SpaceX hopes to fly space tourists to the International Space Station as soon as next year, which is pretty cool. Three tourists can go with one trained flight staff member. You're probably asking yourself, all right, how much is this going to cost? Well, that price tag hasn't been released just yet. The FDA promises to crack down on CBD products sold as food or dietary supplements. The agency warned this week that CBD, which doesn't have the chemical to get you high, might harm your liver or interact with medication. It wants more studies to be done. And the coronavirus is clearly dominating the headlines right now. There is another type of virus you need to watch for, a type of computer virus that is now worse than ever. Consumer reporter John Mattery shows us what to watch out for so you don't waste your money. Computer ransomware is on the rise again in 2020, attacking not just Windows PCs, but MacBooks as well. And if you don't know what to do, you could end up paying a scammer hundreds of dollars to unlock your computer. Charlene Stone was on her PC when an alert took over her screen. The whole screen, this thing popped up on the screen. I'm like, what is that? It urged her to call Microsoft immediately. But Charlene's been hit with computer scans before, so she tried to close the box. Couldn't get the mouse or anything to move. I tried every key on the keyboard and nothing would move. Charlene was victim of ransomware that sneaks into PCs and Apple MacBooks as well. It locks your screen until you hand over your credit card or gift card. What makes these attacks so frightening and why so many people end up paying money to have them removed is because nothing you do seems to be able to make that box go away. You press enter, use your mouse to X out, and the pop-up box still doesn't move. Some versions even have a robotic voice that talks to you. Important security message. John Andrea of Mobile Technology Solutions told me last year people are calling him in a panic. The entire time your computer doesn't have a problem at all. They're just telling you that it has a problem. He says if you get this pop-up, try Control-Alt-Delete first. Doesn't work? Then press the power button. Finally, unplug it. Charlene did that and the PC eventually rebooted with no warning box. You don't know what they're going to do. And nowadays, so many people are stealing your information or whatever. There's one type of ransomware that won't go away with a shutdown because it encrypts your files. You will have to contact a PC repair shop if you're hit with that one. So you don't waste your money working for you. I'm John Maddries for RTV6. Next 12 hours are the coldest in the entire seven-day forecast. The, cl the cloudy skies we have now will clear overnight tonight and set the stage for sunshine over the weekend. Anytime sunshine and the weekend arrive at the same time, that's a good deal. Cold, dry tonight, then we get into a warmer weekend. It's a two-step process. Tomorrow, temperatures warm up a bit. They're more noticeable on Sunday. We turn wet again as we get to early next week. Temperatures stuck in the 30s. That wind can 
continues to be strong and cold out of the northwest. Through the evening hours, the sky will gradually clear and the temperature will fall into the upper 20s. That's at 11 o'clock tonight. Tomorrow morning, temperatures low 20s to the north, mid 20s to the south. The wind direction changes and it's the south wind that will help boost the temperature close to the 50 degree mark tomorrow. But remember, we spend all day just trying to hit that number. Then on Sunday, we'll jump 10 degrees or more to a high of 61. The wind will not be as strong during the day tomorrow. Your hourly forecast includes all that sunshine and we jump from 26 at uh, early morning hours into 40 at noon and about 50 for the afternoon high. The south wind about 10 miles per hour with some slightly higher gusts. Sunday will be stronger wind out of the south. Temperatures start warmer on Sunday. That'll give us a jump on an afternoon high close to 60, 48 at noon. And I think any cloud covers mid to high level clouds that we would expect to move in during the day Sunday ahead of rain chances that we get to early next week. There are the highs on Sunday. Temperatures will be just as mild on Monday. We'll unveil the four day forecast coming up. With daylight saving time starting this weekend, for most of the country, there's always that debate that comes up. Should the U.S. still even be doing this anymore? Well, a Denver man is leading the hashtag lock the clock movement. For six years now, Scott Yates has been working with state legislators and congressmen to try and make this happen. He says, though, this year could actually be the tipping point. You know, I think of it as just good government 101. Like, the government is in charge of the clocks. The clocks are killing people. Like, let's fix it. So when Yates says the clocks are killing people, he's pointing toward research on the impact of losing and gaining sleep, especially in the springtime. Because listen to this. Studies have shown there's an increase in heart attacks and traffic accidents while people adjust. If somebody snuck into your house and changed your alarm clock so it went off an hour earlier than you were expecting, it would be a real jolt. And for some people, that jolt is deadly. For most people, it's okay. For some people, it's deadly. For some people, they're groggy when they get in their car and there's a traffic accident. Most states are working on their own legislation this year. There are also two federal bills. So Yates says he'd like to see states have the option to choose on their own, similar to what's being done in Europe. They passed this last year. They said two years from now, in 2021, we're going to lock the clock, no more clock change. And each individual country has until then to figure out what time zone they want to be in permanently. And I think that's a really smart approach that we should take here in the United States. So he doesn't advocate for either time zone, just that we stop all this switching altogether. Buying furniture, it's not cheap. We all know that. The markup is anywhere between 200 and 400 percent on new furniture. A thousand dollars is considered an inexpensive new sofa and a six seat dining room table about the same. You can go use, but then there's always that hassle of moving it and cleanliness and then safety issues depending on where and who you get it from. But there is one company that's looking to change that. We deliver it, we set it up in your home for free as part of being a member. And at any point, if you don't need your furniture or don't want your furniture, you can return it to us and we will uh, take it back, pick it up from you and uh, clean it, deliver it to the next person. So Feather is a furniture subscription service. It's not like other rent to own business that have gotten a reputation for appealing to lower income and then charging those high markups. Feather members pay $19 a month. That money goes toward any furniture they rent. And if they decide to keep it, well, the payments count towards the retail cost of the piece. Founder Jay Reno says he came up with the idea after he moved seven or eight times in just nine years. Each time you have a different space and a different layout with a different circumstance, you need different things. I realize that the American dream has changed and that instead of buying cars and houses and having the white picket fence, uh, what, what young people who are moving relatively frequently in cities actually want to have is freedom and flexibility. Feather can supply furniture for homes and apartments, offices, and those in staging businesses. They are in New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Orange County right now. But of course, they eventually have plans to expand. And next in our lineup, a hair salon is on the front lines when it comes to gender equality. How they're changing their pricing system so that women don't spend more than men.